which means that this lady has come to testify on behalf of a tracker company that she no longer works for how does that work does the tracker company know that she's representing them as an ex-employee I don't know how that works, child. All of them were prepared to argue from the bar, except for Rumsholol. To top it all off, there were two other people that confirmed these results, or three other people that confirmed these results, all in one day when it took Mandgena three. What could the ID possibly do? Same JP that's always saying, "Oh, this trial is taking too long. Oh, the the delays, the delays." Now wants to practice fairness because it's Kininda. No, 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 no. And I'm bad like the Barbie. I'm a dog, but I still wanna party. Things felt like I'm ready to bend. I'm a ten, so I pull in a ten. Like Jazzy. Hello and welcome to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Nogwazi Ndombela, also known as Kwazi Bear on all social media platforms. Do subscribe, be a part of this family. And if you are a returning subscriber, welcome back, darling. Now, guys, as you know, every week I bring you updates in the Senzo Miiwa trial. And this week has been a lot of stop and go, stop and go in this trial. And it's really frustrating for us who are following this trial because it seems like this trial is just dragging and dragging and dragging. Before we get started on the proceedings for the week, please don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to comment and engage with me in the comment section down below to tell me your thoughts on the trial so far and also do super thanks if you can. Let's get right into the proceedings of the week. Now after the recess, we were expecting Judge Ratamo Hotling to bring his friend to come and discuss the issue of accused number three being kept in solitary confinement and how we can go about actually just sorting that issue out but unfortunately we hear from the judge on monday that he had spoken to the jp and apparently this friend is no longer coming to explain or to try and understand accused number three situation and therefore, the judge tells Umnesi that he needs to bring forward an application for accused number three to actually sort out the issue of him being in solitary confinement. Mgome Zulu then also raises an issue regarding accused number one, which says that he has still not received his ID from the state. Now, accused number one's family is saying that they are trying to apply for legal aid for his children in varsity, and they do require his ID to do these applications. And also, there are some other things that they need to do with accused number one's ID and the state has refused to give the ID back to accused number one. Nisi then brings the concerns of accused number three forward saying that um, he's psychologically not okay because of being kept in solitary confinement for so long and even some of the instructions that he does give to Nisi to him don't make sense. Um, accused number three even went as far as writing a note saying that the judge is being stubborn or the court um, is being stubborn and they're continuing to want to keep him in solitary confinement so he will request for the trial to stop because he is unable to focus on the trial at the present moment. Now, there are some inconsistencies that are pointed out with regards to the state by the defense. Um, firstly, from Mgome Zulu, the defense counsel for accused number one, saying that Sbiya, um has been denied his ID back. However, accused number two received his ID, and the state is saying that um, Sbiya's ID is a part of the exhibits, which doesn't make sense because, I mean, if the state has the ID number or a certified copy, they should be able to give the original to the family of accused number number one so it's inconsistent where all the five accused before the court one his id has been kept by the state whereas the other the id has been given back and um Baloyi keeps raising an issue of safety like what could the id possibly do i mean you've got the id number he's not going to change his identity in jail like what can he possibly do yet on the other side in danzi's id was given back to him and then the second inconsistency is the fact that they're keeping accused number three in solitary confinement and they're saying it is because of the sins of Miwa case these five accused um have been charged with common purpose if that is the case why is it that the other accused in this case are not in solitary confinement so there's just a lack of consistency in the way that things have been handled in this case once all those issues were raised on Monday the 7th of October, then Amnesi continued with his cross-examination of Undini, the ballistic analyst. Now, one of the questions that he touched on is with regards to making a 212 statement. Now, we all know that Dini has come to the court and told us that he 
literally gave an opinion and it wasn't verifying or confirming Mangena's results he just gave an opinion as to what he saw now according to procedure it um it is not required for a person who gives an opinion to write a 212 statement however in this case Ndini did write a 212 statement and he says it was at the request of Baloy now Nisi questions whether he actually let Baloy know that that's not procedural and he does say yeah but Baloy still insisted that I write the statement so now Nisi was just pointing out to Ndini that you went against the procedure that you re usually do um, and you followed the instruction of Ubaloi, who is not even your leader in the ballistic segment. Another question that Nisi touched on is with regards to when do you ask for opinion when you're studying the ballistics? And Dini does respond and says that he literally would go to a person for opinion once he has completed his test. The next question Nisi goes into is which of the bullets did he test? And then Dini does say that he tested um, bullets from TB3 through to TB10 and he saw that all of them had similar marks. Now the question that Nisi then touched on after this is that okay you say that all of them had similar marks why is it that you said to us in court that you chose one with the best marks because if all of them had similar marks you could have just chosen any and then Dini's statement then changes and says no he tested all of them and he just chose one um, because all of them had the same marks which is now inconsistent to what he had told us in his evidence in chief. Now Nisi then says to this um, analyst, tell me, are you just an opinion giver or are you an expert? And Ndini does say that in this case, he was just giving an opinion based on the test bullets that Mangena had given him. Now, the interesting thing that Nisi touches on at this point is with regards to Mangena's testimony or evidence in chief before the court, which says that he tested these bullets from Monday, which was the 20th of July in 2020. He still worked on them on Tuesday and worked on them on, on Wednesday. And um, he only compiled his report on Friday, which was the 20. 4th of July. So now basically this implies that Mangena was not done with his work or with his testing. He had not found results when he asked for Undini's opinion. And Undini seems to disagree with this and he says, no, the reason why it took Mangena so long is because he had to compile a report and so on and so forth. And Undini says, no, 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 don't get me wrong. Don't try to get this twisted. Mangena says in his evidence in chief that he only compiled the statement on Friday, which means he was still busy with the the test on Wednesday when he came to you and then the next question after that is that Mangena is more experienced than you Mr. Ndini and Ndini agrees and he then says well Mangena took three days to test these bullets and could not find the results in three days it took him three days to test the bullets and you not being as experienced as Mangena it only took you one day and to top it all off, there were two other people that confirmed these results or three other people that confirmed these results all in one day when it took Mangena three. Dodge. Nisi then says that he regards Undini as a hired gun. Um, he's basically just here to be used to, to, to corroborate what Mangena has said. And there was some objections with the use of the word hired gun, which the basis was not laid for. Nisi then touches on the issue of the statements that Undini had uh, produced to the court and he says that he's finding it very odd that the similarities between his statement and Krobler's statement are very compelling. Like literally from the way that the words are put to even the punctuation on the statement is exactly the same. Undini responds in saying that they have a standard form that or a standard way in which they produce their statements. Now, the funny thing about Nisi completing his cross-examination is that the judge seemed to be in a hurry to get the witness off the box because he's like, are we done with this witness? Before he even questions whether Ngumalo and Nshololo will cross-examine the witness. Fortunately, Ngumalo and Nshololo didn't have any questions for Rundini. So those were the proceedings for Monday. On Tuesday, the 8th of October, Sibanda commenced with his re-examination. And in all honesty, there was really no need for him to go into 
into this re-examination because he asked three questions that were already answered in the examination in chief so i feel it was a waste of time for him to even bother asking those three questions nisi does indicate that there is an attorney or an advocate who is available to assist umube in the application that he needs to uh, make and the the name of the attorney is Hrunafalt, if i'm not mistaken and they are going to be working on an application to be able to assist Umube get out of the solitary confinement situation that he finds himself in. Baloye then does indicate that they were hoping to get a tracker expert to come and testify on Tuesday. However, they weren't getting a hold of her and that they need a time to actually try and communicate and find out whether she'll be available. Now, this tracker expert is said to come and testify with regards to the movement of Longwetwala's polo that was at the scene of crime on the night of the incident. Ngome Zulu does indicate that he will be opposing this next witness based on the fact that no information with regards to the actual car was given during the examination in chief or cross-examination and Baloyi is simply going off of this evidence based on um Mugome Zulu's version saying that Longwe was at the scene and he shot himself so they try to um bring the tracker expert to be able to rebut Mugome Zulu's um version and it does not make sense why you would bring the tracker instead of the person that has said to have been shot on the day the judge then surprisingly tells us that he has heard that Keninda is writing exams and now my question is how did you know who told you because Baloyi had not stated this before the court? Anyway, it is told we are told that Kininda is writing exams on the 14th, the 16th, and 26th of October, as well as the 12th, the 20th, and the 25th of November. So there seems to be an issue with regards to how much time does he need to testify? Should he be given time to able to be able to study and so on and so forth? And one of the comments that the judge made is that Mangena is writing very important exams. Important for who? In the interest of who? Because it's not in the interest of the public that Mangena is writing these exams. It's not in the interest of the accused who are sitting in jail whilst waiting for Mangena to, um, for Kininda to write these exams. It's not in the interest of this court. It's a waste of time if we are expected to wait for him to go and write his exams for a whole month and adjourn. It does not make sense. Baloy then indicates that they are unable to get a hold of the tracker lady and he indicates also that Kininda will be coming on Wednesday and they can therefore um, either ask him whether he'll be able to give his testimony and have breaks in between when writing his exams. The court adjourned on Tuesday with the expectation of Kininda to come on Wednesday. On Wednesday, the 9th of October, when the court proceeded, Baloi then indicates that the tracker lady has become available and Kininda is not there. Now, the agreement that we had had on Tuesday is that Kininda will be in court. So all of the defense attorneys were expecting Kininda to come and give his testimony. But now Baloi wanted to lead the lady. Mgome Zulu says he doesn't understand why he wants to lead this tracker lady because none of the registration of the polo was referred to during the version of Umgome Zulu basically saying this lady is coming to give information about a polo we don't know the registration of the polo so we don't know if she's leading information of the right polo and the second thing that I was just thinking of is the fact that if we say Longwe was shot and his wound became septic and he went to a doctor to be able to treat that would have would the wound have been septic on the same day I don't think so. And Mgome Zulu did not mention which days did Longwe actually go to the doctor to seek assistance for his um, bullet wound. Ramosipili then requests the states to just be honest with the defense because in all honesty, they had agreed that Kininda would be coming today, which is Wednesday. And now all of a sudden, the state is basically ambushing them with the tracker lady because he had indicated that she, he's unable to get a hold of her on Tuesday and therefore we would proceed with Kininda. And now all of a sudden, the lady is there and he's got his head, heads of arguments and he wants to argue as to why this lady should come. Nisi does say he doesn't understand why the state has prepared heads because the agreement yesterday was that this lady is no longer coming. So the argument of Mgome Zulu to say that he would be opposing um, this witness coming in was, was not even a topic, which is accurate. 
but anyway the state then does lead his heads of arguments and he does explain as to why he wants this witness to be called and how the allegations against Longwe are so serious that they need to prove them wrong once the state was completed um, with his heads of arguments all the defense counsels were ready to argue from the bar so they had not prepared any heads of argument the night before because Baloyi had not told them to but after they've heard what he said all of them were prepared to argue from the bar except for Rumsholola. Rumsholola then requests that she give, she be given time overnight to be able to prepare her argument so that she can argue on Thursday. Then Baloyi wants to address the issue of Geninda's exams, but he says he wants to address them in chambers, in private, because a person's educational info is private. And I'm like, we've been talking about this for the past three days. Now it's private? How? So the judge also says, no, he doesn't want anything to be spoken in private. He wants everything to be out in the open. So we need to speak about Geninda's issues right there and then. Now, Mnesi does raise the issue that Geninda was actually called on Tuesday afternoon by all the councils. He was not available at the time. And it was said that Geninda himself said that he wanted to come and testify, but he would only request that he be given the day before his exam and the day of his exams off. So basically, if he's going to be writing on the 15th, he requests that the 14th be a day off and the 15th be a day off. So we adjourn for those two days and then he comes back when he's not writing and so on and so forth. Sibili also confirms this com communication that took place and he says that this is the com uh, conversation that we had with Kininda and so we're expecting Kininda to come. And the, say and the fact that the judge is saying that we should practice fairness is really not making sense because this person had agreed, we had an agreement with this person. Mnisi then raises an argument, which was a very strong argument for me, where he says that they also run their own private practices. And the judge has not practiced any fairness to them when saying that they should not take on any other cases because of the Senzo Miyua case. They have denied some cases. They have put some cases on hold because of this case. And now suddenly, because Gininda needs to go right, we must practice fairness. He even goes as far as saying, if that's the case and you want to practice fairness for Kininda, then you should allow me to take on the cases that you've stopped me from taking as the court and I will only be available in the second term next year or the, the second quarter next year. Nisi then also points out that it's not in the interest of these accused. The court keeps on delaying the proceedings. They want this trial to be finalized as soon as possible. And the one point that really, really, really knocked it out of the fence for me is the fact that we adjourned for a good three weeks some time ago because the state no longer had any witnesses and we were waiting for Mangena's cross-examination. Why didn't they call Kininda? Because Kininda was well aware that he'll be writing in October and November. So in those three weeks, why wasn't his evidence led? Nisi even goes as far as saying Kininda isn't going to come with anything new. He should have been led during the three weeks of that recess that we had or the break that we had when the state had no witnesses, which is so valid. Um, Shololo indicates that because of the agreement that they had with Kininda, she no longer prepared the arguments. However, she wants to say that they did have a conversation with Kininda. He did agree that he would come. And Mshololo had requested Kininda and the state to provide a timetable for Kininda's exams. And that was not provided to the defense. And another thing that Mshololo had requested from Kininda is his leave days. Because now remember, if you are employed and you're going to write those special exams, as the judge puts it, you apply for leave from work and if that leave is approved for those certain days then the court can also say because you have leave for these days and these days will also allow you to be off but for the days that you don't have leave you need to come to court because it's part of your job as the inv investigating officer so that was very much valid from Mshololo. Mshololo also does point out that the JP the same JP that's always saying, oh, this trial is taking too long. Oh, the, the delays, the delays. Now wants to practice fairness because it's Kininda. No, 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 no. The JP has an order 
against Umshololo for the time that Umshololo actually went to um, represent another client in another case during this trial and she was unavailable in this trial. She says the JP has an order against her. Now Kininda can just go and go write exams for a whole month. No, if we can prioritize this case, everyone else should prioritize this case. The judge then says he wasn't aware of the agreement between Kininda or the phone call that happened between Kininda and the defense and because there was an agreement that was made kininda must just come kininda must just come now another thing that they touched on on wednesday is the fact that accused number one has still not received received his id and baloyi then says no they have certified copies that they can give to Mgomezulu. they don't need the original my question is why are you gojaring this id why are you keeping this id with you and he even says he'll ask the investigating team if it's safe to give it back Jani, Jani. On Thursday, the 10th of October, Mgomezulu signals that he will be withdrawing, opposing the witness for the tracker to come forward. And the judge makes a comment saying, wise move. I was just like, why is he saying wise move? Is he saying wise move because he was already going to rule that the state can call this witness? Or w what is it? Now, in light of the fact that Mgomezulu has withdrawn this, then the rest of the defense counsel also say they also withdraw and we're good to listen to the next, next witness. The next witness that was called was Maria Elizabeth Pretorius, who was a tracker expert um, for the tracking company that Longway used in his polo. Now, the interesting thing about this lady is the fact that she worked for this tracker company from 2016 right through to 2021, which is way after the incident, but that's not the point. The point is that now she's working for the SAPS in the K9 unit. Which means that this lady has come to testify on behalf of a tracker company that she no longer works for. How does that work? Does the tracker company know that she's representing them as an ex-employee? I don't know how that works child but she's here and she does give us details on the vehicle that was driven like the registration number which is cm42 hk and um it is registered to s twala it seems like everything galongwe is registered to his father but anyway and she does say that she was requested to track to to check the tracker details for the dates the 24th of october 2014 through to the 27th of october 2014. now my thing is yet again i think i mentioned this at the beginning of my video is that the dates in which we requested for this tracker are limited to these three days being the 24th 25th 26th and 27th okay four days they're limited to the four days and the incident happened on the 26th which means that the movement of the car on the 26th and the 27th is what we have available when does a wound become septic i'm guessing well after two days so we would need information for the days after that and also who is to say that Longwe used his car the polo when going to the alleged doctor that fixed him up when Baloye leads this witness he wants to focus on the 26th and he focuses on a one transaction at the beginning of his examination in chief which was on the 26th of October 2014 at 1857.29. This is where the lady says the car is moving on Kutlanong Street. Now this is the time that Longwe allegedly arrived at the Kumalo household. So he was driving on Kutlanong Street at 1857.29 then at 1858.34 the ignition was off and it's at Gudranong Street so I'm guessing that's when he stopped at um, Kelly Kumalo's household. The next transaction is at 1914 seconds where the ignition goes on again and then again at 1901.28 the ignition is turned off. Now this is the interesting time that I want us to look into which is at 2043.34. Now at 2043.34 is when the car is in motion. He, the, the, the lady says the car is in motion. And then at 2043.44 which is 10 seconds later 
their ignition is off. So my thought is saying this was the time that Longwe was moving his car from behind Senzo's because we've heard in the testimony of the witnesses that Longwe's car was parked behind Senzo's car on the night of the incident. And the question that we've all been having is when Longwe ran out of the house after um, the intruders came in, where did he run to? Did he go to his car? Did he not go to his car? What happened? Now, looking at the time indicated here being 2043, when the car is in motion, this is either after Senzo was shot or after Longway ran out of the house, right? And the car doesn't move for more than 10 seconds. So my thought is that he just moved the car out of the way. What's now very important about this very same time is that that accused number three's cell phone records indicate that at 2032, there was a call that he was on where in Holt Street in Johannesburg. So this is just further proof that he couldn't have been at the scene at 2043, if that's when Senzo was shot. And also this is an indication that Senzo was not shot at eight o'clock, like everybody has been saying between eight and, and, and nine. He was actually shot after half past eight. As we were getting into the juicy details of the tracker evidence, Mgomezulu indicates that he is not feeling well and the court does adjourn on Thursday. On Friday, the 11th of October, we were expecting the court to continue. However, Mgomezulu is still not well and he was not in court on Friday. Therefore, we have adjourned until Monday where we will continue to hear the evidence of the lady from the tracker. Another interesting thing that I went back into because I'm one person that will go back into my notes. I went back into Longwe Twyla's cell phone records. Well, at least the records that the state decided to lead to us. And the interesting thing about the cell phone towers is that at 2043, which is the same time that the car was in slow motion um, for 10 seconds, the tower that the, the phone was picking up was Parkhe. And this tower we now know is about 2.2 kilometers away from the Kumalo household. So I'm not sure whether it was pulling from that tower at the time. And then at 2046, the phone was pulling from Pretoria North. Now this Pretoria North tower isn't a tower that um, Pinky by Thillingham gave us the coordinates for. So I'm not sure of the distance from that tower to the Kumalo res residence. But another interesting thing is that at 2050, Longwest phone was at Straight View Tower, which is also 1.18 kilometer away from the Kumalo household. So you can see that it was still circulating or triangulating in the towers which were within the Kumalo residence. But then at 2059, almost 10 minutes after the, the car was on and off, then Longwe's phone is at Clinics, which was 3.9 kilometers away from the Kumalo household, which means that Longwe was at the hospital just one minute before nine. And I'll actually go back into my notes to find out what time Senzo arrived at the hospital because according to this, at 2059, Longwe's cell phone was already in clinics. Those were the proceedings for the week. It was a whole lot of stop and go, but I'm hoping that next week we get to finalize the evidence of this tracker witness and see whether the defense will cross-examine this witness so that we can get into Kininda, the mastermind. So those are the proceedings for the week, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this video and enjoy your weekend. I will see you next week. Bye.